found a text here with um, the first in a series of videos about the file system called ZFS. Now, um, I've intended this to be kind of ad hoc series of, series of videos um, just to sort of fill in my time when I've got a spare moment to do a um, different part of it. So, um, I will do a complete set, I promise that. It's not going to be something I'm going to start and forget about. Um, but it will be, as I say, a bit ad hoc every now and then. Um, but hopefully not too much time in between each episode that I publish. Um, and really, it's something that I've been wanting to do for a long time, but it's kind of been difficult for me in my head to work out how I'm going to present it, because it's... Um, uh, it's quite a, at one level it's quite a simple subject and at other levels it's quite complex and it's knowing where to strike the balance um, with what what information to present. So I hope I'm going to do it at quite a decent level that's not too simple and also that's not too complicated. Um, I've got this slide pack, which is a slide pack that's quite old now. It's something I remember finding oh, about 10 years or so ago when I first discovered ZFS. Um, and as you can see, it's from uh, the Sun Microsystems company, as it was then, um, published by a guy called Jeff Bonwick and another one called Bill Moore. Jeff Bonwick was the chief architect if you like of ZFS and I believe Bill Moore was uh, I think it was like chief um, technical officer um, for the project um, but yeah the pair of them are um, basically invented ZFS um, there's another guy who's involved called um, Ahrens I think his name is Matt Ahrens um, he was also one of the architects, but um, I don't know why his name's not involved in this. Maybe he didn't design the initial specification of ZFS, maybe he came in later. Um, so I'm going to go through this slide pack. Some of it's a little bit out of date. Some of it I'm just going to skip over because, like I said, I don't want to get too bogged down in the detail. Um, really, the, the idea of these videos is to put across the plus points of which there are many that ZFS has to offer over all other uh, file systems that are out there and I'm including BTRFS in that as well even though BTR, BTRFS is a similar technology um, I've got some issues with BT, BTRFS, I've tried it um, but I haven't used it a great deal um, there's various reasons for that um, I suppose I could name them out actually. It's a project that's come later to the table, so it's not as mature as ZFS, which is one of the key things with it. Although I believe ZFS has had problems over the year with corruption and so on, um, I've never ever seen anybody write about ZFS in the same way that I've seen people write about BTRFS and the problems I've had there. Um, even just recently, this last year gone by, I was considering um, testing it again for, um, you know, with an intention to use it um, in a live environment. And there was another issue with um, corruption on volumes. Um, and it happened a few years ago when I was looking into it, about two or three years ago, I think. Um, and I'm aware that Ubuntu have made it an option as one of their file systems, I think, in 2016. Um, but I'm also very aware, I think it's Fedora included it in their distributions up until, I think, a year or so ago. And they've now withdrawn it or they're going to they're gonna withdraw it as one of the options for this file system. So, to me, I've still got lots of doubts about using BTRFS as a reliable um, syst uh, file system. ZFS on the other hand I've been using for at least 10 years when it was a um, Fuse module, a module that attached to Linux through the Fuse um, system 
Um, I've used it on all sorts of machines, um, even on a 486. I've used it on a 486. I've used it on a Pentium Pro and so on. Um, and I've touched wood. I've never, ever once had a problem with it. Um, it's always behaved as ex exactly as it's supposed to behave. Um, I can't praise it enough, to be quite honest. So that is the reason why, as I say, I want to present these videos to demonstrate to anybody who's not aware of ZFS that really is a superior file system in many ways. Um, let's say, although BTRFS is the same technology, it offers similar features. I, I, I can't, I can't recommend that to, to be used in a live environment to play around with, to experiment with. Yeah, fine. But uh, I, I wouldn't want to um, recommend that as being reliable at the moment. So what I should do is just quickly go over a little bit of the history first, and then I'll go to uh, back to the slideshow um, and go through some of the slides on there. There's about 40 slides, but I won't be going. I say we'll talk you through all of them. Um, if you want to look at the slide pack yourself it's freely available on the internet if you just type in basically the title you, you can see there in white zfs the last word in file systems you'll come across plenty of links for this pdf um, there's actually two versions i've seen one's just by bill moore and it looks like it's the information in there is a little bit more um, not basic but this pack with jeff bonwick's name on it there's a little bit more information so it's it's probably the better one to go for um, in, in those, those sort of terms. So I don't, I don't know quite know what happened if um, Bill Moore put up the first spec and then Jeff Bonwick's added to it. I don't know. But I'd say there's two, but this one with the 44 slides is, is the one I'll be going through. So um, I'll go through a quick um, history lesson then. Um, ZFS was invented um, in 2001 um, by Jeff Bonwick uh, when he was at Sun Microsystems um, and I think it was 2005 um, it was brought into Solaris as one of the available file systems so it's taken about four years to develop it um, and it was made, it was a standard feature of Solaris 10 in 2006. So about five years to become a standard part of the Solaris operating system that some microsystems had at the time or as, as they were at the time. They obviously don't exist anymore because um, Oracle bought them in 2010. Um, now when that happened, when Oracle bought some microsystems, um, ZFS became a uh, technology that was, I believe, trademarked and obviously owned by Oracle. And at that time, they stopped releasing Solcoast for the new Open Solaris that um, I think had recently started a new project around around that time. So that effectively made ZFS closed source, which it was originally. So originally it was closed source, and then it became open source, and then Oracle bought ZFS. Oh, sorry, Oracle bought some microsystems, and the ZFS technology went closed source again. So, in 2013, um, a project called Open Open ZFS was founded to develop an open source version of ZFS, and they maintain and manage the ZFS code. Um, and it's the ZFS that's used mostly in all Unix-like systems these days. Um, so part of what's available on Linux systems is another project called OpenZFS, which was started uh, around about... Uh, 2000 and I think it was 2013 was it 
yeah, 2013 OpenZFS was uh, started, and that's the current um, like ZFS project that uh, is used by many of the Linuxes that are around there now. I have to say, actually, just after the um, ZFS was bought by Oracle, um, there was a port. Sorry, no, sorry, it was just after ZFS was released um, as part of the Open Solaris project. There was a Fuse, a ZFS port for Fuse started in 2006. Um, and so that's what I, I started using ZFS, was that project. And it was okay. It was, um, weren't that many features then. ZFS was a lot older then, or a lot younger, sorry, I should say, fewer features. And there's been more features added over time. But um, it worked fine. There was no problems with that. Um, it was just a bit clunky because it was a fuel, Fuse uh, plug-in, if you like. But as I say, in um, 2013, this OpenZFS project started, um, and it's it's much more integrated into the kernel. Um, it's still a module that needs to be compiled, but it doesn't need Fuse, so you've got the advantage of uh, a layer that's missing. It, the um, ZFS modules can talk almost directly with the kernel. Um, there is actually a layer in between, which is uh, basically a portability layer between the Solaris calls and the kernel is like a sort of wrapper. Um, and that's what's currently being used by all the big distributions such as Ubuntu. Uh, the reason why there is an issue with not including the ZFS code in the kernel is because of the type of license that ZFS has been issued with. It's not compatible with the Linux, uh, Linux kernel. So that's that's why there's all these issues. It's, it's quite complicated. Um, you can read on the wiki pages about ZFS and OpenZFS ZFS as well, and ZFS on Linux um, give you all the ins and outs if you're really interested. But that's as far as I want to go. So basically, ZFS is nearly 20 years old since it was first invented, if you like. Uh, 15 years approximately since it was first released as a working system. And if you contrast that with BTRFS, which, um, well, the B tree that was used and it wasn't proposed until 2007, um, and it wasn't released um, until uh, initial release until uh, I think it's 20, uh, 2009. So you can see that's quite a lot later than ZFS. It's uh, come come to the table with its version of the same technology. A lot later. Having said that, the big thing, the big draw, which is why I keep going back to it every now and then, it is part of the kernel, the, the Linux kernel, so it is native, if you like. It's just a mm, bit, bit iffy still, in my opinion, to, to use. Um, I've been using ZFS on live systems for approximately five or six years ago, systems that are up 24 7. Um, as I say, touch wood, and never ever been one single problem with them. Um, those systems running ZFS at all. Um, I've even got some uh, ZFS systems that have been running, uh, well, that started out as ZFS via the Fuse plugin, and they've been upgraded since then, and again, they're still just working um, as they were the first day they were brought online. So, you know, I, I can't fault it at all. So I'll go on to these slides now um, and go through some of the features that make ZFS different from uh, just about every other file system out there. Uh, so let's go to, yeah, this first page is worth going through. So the first thing is um, it uses a notion called pooled storage. So at the moment you have a disk and you're limited by the size of that disk as to how big a, a, a portion or a unit of um, disk space or file of a file system you can have. So if you've got a, a 20 gigabyte hard disk, the biggest, biggest file system you can create is a 20 gigabyte, 20 gigabyte system. If you get, bring in another 20 gigabyte uh, disk, that's another 20 gigabyte system. So you've got two separate file systems 
that are 20 gigabytes each. ZFS does away with this idea and it pulls all storage. So any number of hard disks you want to put together, all that space is pulled together and it appears as one unit. So you could have two 20 gig hard disks and they appear as a 140 gigabyte uh, pool that you can utilize and ZFS manages the disks as a user you don't need to worry which disks are being used or where the um, data is allocated from um, the file system transactional so a bit like a database would be any changes to the database or any changes to the file system either happen or they don't happen to the database or the file system is never left in an unknown state so it's the, I think I've, I've heard them called atomic transactions I can't remember what the ATOM stands for now um, but it's guaranteed that the data has either gone onto the disk or it's not gone onto the disk and obviously if it hasn't you'll get an error saying it hasn't happened so the, the, the file system is never in an unknown state and therefore, because as it says here, because oops, because the um, data is always consistent on disk, there's no such concept of a file system check. So that's something to think about. If you, if the system crashes and you have to reboot, there's none of this having to write, run a file system check before you um, can use the file system again. So that's something to consider. There is a form of file system checking, um, but it's not in the traditional sense. Um, and we'll cover that on the later slide. Um, and even then, that's online. I um, think I should mention that now, actually. I'm not sure if it's mentioned specifically, but everything you do with a ZFS file system is online. You never need to take it offline at all. So again, that's something else to consider. If you have a problem with a disk with traditional file systems, you have to take them offline if they're being used and resolve the problem you've got there. For example, if, if it's a system drive, you can't run the system. You've got to boot from a rescue disk or some rescue partition to check the structures of, of the file system. So with ZFS, there's no need for that. It's done all, all online. Um, Universal, I think this means that you can basically allocate any sort of storage, whether it's a file, a block, iSCSI, or swap, any anything you can use, you can do anything with it, basically. Um, now, one, perhaps the key thing about ZFS, if, yeah, the, the, I'd say this is probably the key thing about it, and it's the one big thing that drew me to it, um, it detects and corrects silent data corruption and what that is I don't know if like me I've had this on Windows more than Linux but I have had it on Linux you have a file that's been sitting on disk for years maybe and I have found this more with zip files I think archive files you go to extract the file and you find it won't extract it's been corrupted somehow and you think well you check the disk and there's nothing wrong with it but this file's been corrupted and how's that so you go to your backups, and the backup the the, the uh, zip file is corrupt on the backup. Oh, that's a bit strange. And there's this concept of silent data corruption. It's where a bit flips on the disk, but it's on the data part of the file, not the metadata, not the file structures of the file system. So as far as the file system is aware, everything's fine. There's no problems. But you've had this one bit flip in the data in that file, and that's the reason why you can't extract the data from that zip file because it's suddenly failing the checksums or, or failing the extraction algorithm. So ZFS counteracts that by doing checksums left, right and centre. Um, and because it's doing these checksums, it's been historically, historically considered to be too expensive to do this. And I still think that's too expensive to do because you're checking, you're reading, you're writing... But when you come to see the performance of uh, ZFS, it's actually, yes, it might be a little bit slower, but it's not extremely slow. And um, when you consider what it's doing underneath the bonnet, um, the fact that you might notice it's a little bit slower 
it's it's no worry. It's not a worry. And when you get into raids using multiple discs, you're getting back um, uh, speed improvements anyway because ZFS will read off several discs at once and give you data as fast as you you can use it basically. So it's it's it, like it says there. It's, it's historically considered to be too expensive. It's not true. Simple administration. We'll see that towards the end of the slide pack that the commands are fairly straightforward. There's a, uh, it, it's, I would say, pretty standard Oracle way of doing things. You've got a command um, and a verb and a noun type of uh, command structure. So it's fairly simple um, to get to learn the commands um, uh, to manage the, the ZFS file system. Um, and so it says here the trouble with existing file systems. So here's this silent data corruption. As it says here, there could be any dis any defect in the disk, the controller, the cable, the driver, the laser, firmware, anything like this can be running, uh, can corrupt data silently. Uh, and like it says, it's like running a server without error checking memory. So that's one of the things that they do recommend that you have is if you're serious about running ZFS, um, especially on a server, that to guarantee that you're going to capture all these silent data corruptions that you run with ECC so that if the corruption happens in memory, that the data that's going to be written to disk is either corrected or it's flagged up as being bad. Um, basically, you're extending the the path where error checking is done. So it's not to do with the di just the disk subsystem. It's to do with the whole um, path from the disk all the way up to the memory. Um, so that's that's a definite recommendation. Um, so they're brutal to manage. We've got the concept of labels, partitions, volumes, provisioning, growing and shrinking, etc. Possibly even uh, configuration files that need to be managed in the ETC hierarchy. Um, Again, there's lots of limits on how big the file system is. As I said, you're limited by the size of the disks that you provide in the system or the number of uh, the file size. There's file size limits depending on what file system you're using. For example, FAT has got its own limits. Um, the number of files, number of files per directory, number of snapshots, number of inodes, all these sort of things. Um, are all limits that if you're running big enterprise systems you could possibly come across um, different tools to manage the file blocks SCSI, the iSCSI, NFS, Samba and so on so with um, ZFS there's two basic commands there's one to manage the pool and one to manage the file systems and the, the file system one is the one you'll be using 99% of the time to to manage the, the file system itself. There's a couple of other, I think it's two or three other um, binaries that come as part of the package, but they're really for managing or debugging the file system and looking into the um, sort of structures, the metadata underneath the hood. So I won't be going through that. It's um, far, far too tacky um, to need to know that. Uh, just to just to use this, the file system is is not really necessary. Of course, if you want to go into that, that's, that's something you can do. Um, another thing with uh, existing file systems, another problem is that they're not generally portable. So you might have um, some systems, for example, Little Endian, and others a Big Endian, and ZFS makes it all transparent. It basically sets a flag if it. Um, I can't remember which way around it is. You know, if it's big ending, it will set a flag, and if it's little ending, it will reset that flag. So when it goes onto the a file system, goes onto a particular system, it knows whether that system's big ending or little ending, and it can adjust that flag and therefore adjust its behaviour. So you know, uh, you can transport file systems between any technology, and it's it's just transparent the way it stores the data. And it's got dog slow here as the last bullet point. Linear time frame with fat locks, fixed block size, prefetches which are naive, 
dirty re- region logging, painful raid rebuilds, growing back up time. Even with raids, there's a problem with the raid five um, hole. There's a problem there where data can be lost and um, ZFS gets around all these problems. So, as it says here, the reason why they started this project was to end the suffering, figure out why storage has got so complicated, blow away 20 years of obsolete apps, assumptions, and designed an integrated system from scratch, which is what they did. So, they say, well, why, why do volumes exist? Well, in the beginning, you had a small disk and you put the file system on top of that. Fair enough. But then you want more space, you start adding in more disks. Um, and it says customers want more space, bandwidth, and reliability. And it's hard to re- design existing file systems to, to solve these problems well. You have to go with what you've currently got. And the easy way to get around this is to insert a shim, basically a volume, to cobble disks together. So that's what you did. You just keep on adding more disks, you end up with more file systems. And as the system, the industry grew up around this file system on top of a volume model. So you have a file system and a volume manager, which are different products. And you've got different problems with the file system volume interface, which can't be fixed. So you can see here that you can concatenate disks. So you've got one gig disk here. You add in another one. So it's kind of... Um, like just a bunch of disks, like a RAID 0 type thing to get the one file system. Or you can strike them where you got them, um, even a nod. Or you can mirror them. So in these two cases, you've got two gigabytes of data. One's an additional one, one strike where you switch between both sides. And you've got here a one gigabyte um, file system, but it's mirrored. So it's like a kind of redundancy on the disks. So it's um, not the best of worlds. So here's the comparison between what the traditional volumes have and what ZFS tries to do. So you can see you've got these groups of um, disks which create a volume and on top of that you've got the file system. And the abstraction is the virtual disk which is kind of what you got here with the file system there's several disks underneath and while one file system with the volume so you got partition and volume for each file system you have to grow and shrink them by hand if you're on a disk you've got to somehow incorporate that into the volume and also increase the file system as well each file system has got limited bandwidth and storage is fragmented and stranded across each of these volumes ZFS approach is completely different. You just take all these disks and you make one big storage pool. So if you imagine these six disks on the uh, left here on the traditional, you don't have an idea of a volume. You just have a pool of disks. You just keep on adding disks into this pool to increase the size. And then um, once you've got this pool, you can just allocate as many file systems as you like. There's no concept of a fixed size file system. All the file systems can see the space available on that pool. So each one of these file systems here, these three ZFS file systems, can see the same amount of spare space within the storage pool. If this one allocates 10 gigabytes, obviously the storage pool goes down by 10, and but consequently also these um, file systems also go down by 10 gigabytes, but it still can see the same amount of space available. So that's what these bullet points are saying. Um, I'm not sure what this is. This is uh, some sort of um, programmer's thing, developer's thing, malloc stroke free. I'm not sure what that is. Probably it's saying that the free space is abstracted by this storage pool. There's no partitions to manage because you're just creating file systems on, on top of the pool that's available. And the file systems grow and shrink automatically. So if you delete that 10 gigabyte file, then all these file systems see 10 gigabytes free space available uh, as extra space. All bandwidth is always available because you've got all these disks which can supply their bandwidth into the storage pool. And as it says, all storage in the pool is shared. 
So you can have as many file systems as you like. They all see the same amount of free space, but obviously they manage their own data within that pool. Um, yeah, so this is going on about the interfaces between the various levels. So traditional file system volume IO stack. The block interface we've got here between the volume and the file system. It's saying we we'll write this block, then that block. And at the moment of a power loss, you lose this consistency because it may not have finished writing the sequence of blocks. Um, and then the workaround, as you know, we've got journaling, for example, in X3 and X4, as well as a few other, other file systems use journaling, which is slow and complex. It does obviously slow down the file system to have to update a journal, as well as the actual data that's being written. And then with the block interface, when you've got multiple disks, if you lose power, you've then got to find out which of these disks is the correct one to copy the data from or to sync um, with the remaining disks in the, in the um, uh, set of disks that are uh, uh, operating. So in the ZFS IO stack, um, Transactions uh, atomic, uh, as it says here, object based transactions. It's, the command is make these seven changes to these three objects and it will go away and it won't mark it as complete till everything it knows that all these changes are on disk and they're secured and safe. Uh, contrast that with what happens with the traditional method, it just write one block. It will complete that, write another block, complete that. If there's a power failure, not sure where we got to, how much data has been written. It could be that there were 10 blocks to be written. Space has been made in the file system for those 10 blocks, but only five have been written. So that means there's potentially five blocks of free space that's marked as allocated, but that hasn't actually got any data in it. If this failed here, then obviously it will be marked up, but the changes that have been made up to the point will be rolled back or they would be, wouldn't be marked as complete. Um, so the situation would be as if, if, if there was a failure, it would be as if this change had never been made. So at the lower level between the data management unit and the uh, pool, you've got this transaction group commit. So it's atomic for the entire group. Again, there's all atomic transactions to keep consistency and therefore there's no journal needed because it's either all or nothing. And then at the um, storage level, there's a scheduler which can aggregate an issue IO at will. So it, it can say, you know, we need to put some information on this disk or I can get information from this disk because that disk is busy and this disk has got the information that that disk has had if it's a mirror, for example. Um, there's no need to resync if power is lost, and it says it runs at platter speed, so it's obviously you know, running as fast as these disks can give the data. Basically, it's saying that this is some sort of intelligent um, mechanism. It, it knows intimately about the disks and what they've got, what sort of data they've got, and so on. So universal storage, the data management unit is a general purpose transactional object store. So it's basically a database if you like. And a data set, which is, a, you'll come across this um, quite a lot, a, data, a ZFS data set. It's just the um, uh, sun way of calling a file system. It's, it's what their, their equivalent of a file system is. So a data set is a file system, it's a, it's a ZFS file system. And as you can see, the, the numbers are astronomical, up to 2 to the 48 objects, and each of those single objects can be 2 to the 64 bytes. That's an, an immense amount of information. Key features common to all data sets, all, all file systems can have snapshots, compression, encryption, and more importantly, end-to-end -end data integrity. Sorry, I keep clicking the slide. And... You can have any flavor you want. You, these can be 
anything. They can be files, blocks, objects, or networks. So you can see here, here's a storage port allocated. So if you like, this is the hardware. This is the disks. This is the data management unit that manages this part of it. And then on top of here, you've got these different um, interfaces, if you like, um, which the user um, systems can interface to. So this is the bit that we would normally be dealing with. So you can have a local file system on the disk. You can make it available as a network file system or even a Samba file system. So in theory, you wouldn't need separate um, NFS tools or Samba tools because th these um, protocols are made available within uh, ZFS natively, you know, by itself. Um, I don't actually use either of these. I still use traditional tools, actually. I've never never tried using them. Perhaps I should one day. <laughs> um, but I, I just use everything through the local interface. But as you can see, there's other ways you could do it over the network with iSCSI and so on. Um, you can even have a swap drive on, on ZFS, although I've tried that and I've read that it's not, not good. Um, it's obviously not as fast, but if you want the integrity, it's the way to go with ZFS. So a quick overview of how ZFS works. Um, is it worth going? Yeah, I'll just quickly go through these. It, it uses a um, tree. Uh, it's called a Merkle tree, where every single block has got its own checksum. And this is what makes um, ZFS have um, data integrity as its key USP, if you like, its unique selling point. Um, and as I say, the, the reason I first got interested in this was the integrity. It wasn't so much the speed. And believe me, the, the first versions of ZFS were a little bit slow that I used. Um, although I have to say, I think over the years I've found that it does depend on what kind of setup and the kind of hardware you have. It does seem to make quite a difference um, to the performance of ZFS. So um, probably come on to that either. Yeah, probably want to come to demonstrate the uh, file system using the command line. Not, maybe not on this slideshow. But you can see there's like a what they call an Uber block, which is this top block. It's like the the mother of all blocks and it has child blocks and each of those child blocks have more blocks and so on you just work the way down this tree um, and when it makes changes to the file system it uses something called copy on write and what that is is it only changes parts of the file system that it needs to so it will make a copy of that data and then change that data and then alter the pointers to point to that new data. And I think that's what this slide is trying to show. So it's showing that's the existing state of the file system tree. We're going to make some changes to these two blocks here. So the first thing it does is it duplicates them. It copies them. So that's the copy part of it. It then makes the changes to those blocks, which I think is what's representing here with these arrows. And then when it's made those changes, they're secured, it just changes the pointers to point at the new blocks, which is why we've now got the green blocks in, in this last slide. And the reason why the green blocks have changed is, although the data is changed at this level, in this uh, second quadrant, because the checksums have changed, this has to be reflected all the way up the tree. So this is why we get these two boxes go green because there's changes there and then these ones go green because that's pointing to these dependencies here and finally the uber block is written and that's the bit that secures all those changes if that wasn't changed and that uber block didn't get written it would still be pointing at the original data so the initial tree would still be the valid state so you can see it's not until that uber block gets changed that the update is made. So all the preparation is done in, in beforehand, if you like, and it's not until the change is made in the Uber block that the update is visible. So that is how 
the consistency is retained. So if, for example, um, the system was making these changes, if there's a power cut, reboot the system, because the Uber block is still pointing at the blue boxes behind here, this is the state of the tree when we rebooted after the power cut. So although you've lost that change, it's only a minimal amount of data. But the, the key thing is, is the file system still in a consistent state? There's no need to do a file system check. That means you can turn the PC back on, reboot it, and it's up and running immediately. And all you've done is you've lost you know, maybe a fraction of a second of data. And all you need to do is retry it. Um, so sorry, yeah, the that was the copy on write. So the copying is the copying of the blocks that need to be changed, and then the write is the final writing of the Uber block to make those changes. And then because of that, we've got something called constant time sna snapshots. At the end of the transaction group, so that that's the whole transaction. Don't free copy on writeed blocks or copy on written blocks and what it's saying here we can actually take snapshots of the previous state so if we've taken a snapshot of the um, this file system which is the blue part made the change and the green part gets updated that's now the live one we've still got a snapshot pointing at the old state because we're doing copy on writes we're copying and updating every single change. So you can see the original data was copied and updated. The parent blocks were copied and updated with the new checksums and new pointers and so on. So this is how the snapshotting comes as a bonus because it's just there. All you need to do is get a pointer pointing at the old um, image of the data. And all it's cost you at this point is um, the data to say you've got a snapshot pointing at that block. So it says here the tricky part, how do you know when a block is free? Well, it goes into some detail about how that works. Um, I'm not going to go into that. It's quite detailed. You don't really need to know about it if, unless you want to uh, try and understand it. But it's not necessary to uh, for the purpose of this video, which is all about the features of ZFS. Um, this slide's giving a reason why integrity is becoming more and more important. Um, it's saying that uncorrectable bit error rates have stayed roughly constant. So for desktop class drives, so that's the type of drives you'd be getting in ordinary desktops or laptops, there's normally an error rate of 1 in 10 to the 14 bits and for enterprise there's um, an error rate of 10 times less often, which is 1 in 10 to the 15, allegedly it says. So in practice it's saying there's a bad sector for every 8 to 20 terabytes in desktop and enterprise. Now, with drive capacity doubling every month, obviously that increases the chance of a bad bit not being corrected and if you imagine enterprises where they've got multiple RAID drives obviously the chance of getting a bad bit not being corrected you know just just goes up increases rapidly number of drives per deployment are increasing and sorry and therefore it's a rapid increase in error rates and both silent and noisy data corruption becoming more common Silent data corruption is data corruption that goes unnoticed and noisy is data corruption that actually does get identified. So the integrity in ZFS, it's the way it works means that more of the silent corruption will become noisy and therefore be identified. So either it can be acted on or admin, the administrator can be notified that something bad has happened. And also it says a cheap flush storage will only accelerate this trend. Um, so that it was measured at CERN, the um, place in, well, it was mostly in Switzerland, in Central Europe, 
um, where they've got the particle accelerator. Um, they wrote a simple application to write and verify a one gigabyte file. And it wrote one meg, slept a second until one gigabyte had been written. And then it read one meg, it verified it, slept one second and so on. And it ran on 3000 rack servers with hardware RAID. And after three weeks, they found 152 instances of silent data corruption where they had previously thought everything was fine. So the hardware RAID was only detecting noisy errors. So it was only errors that the hardware RAID could detect. So that's why there was a need for end-to-end -end verification to catch this, this silent data corruption, which is where ZFS comes in. So... Currently, with disk block checksums, you have a block of data with its own checksum, and that's it. And it says here, the checksum stored within data block. Any self-consistent block will pass, so you could get an alteration of data such that the checksum is still valid. <laughs> so you've got data corruption and it's not been detected. You can't detect stray writes, and there's obviously an inherent file system of volume interface limitation. There's no... There's no link there between um, any corruption between the volume and the file system. So it says here, the disk checksum only validates the media, which is the bit right itself. You can't detect any of these other problems. In ZFS, the data authenticate is stored in the parent block pointer. So therefore, there's isolation between the data and the checksum because the checksum is passed down to the next block so the checksum for this bit of data, for example, is in the parent block, and so on. And this is what's called a Merkle tree, and as it says, it's self-validating. And because it validates everything all the way up to the Uber block, um, all these silent um, data corruption uh, locations can be detected because each level is linked. Uh, if I go back again, actually, it says here ZFS validates the entire I.O. path, and this is why it's important to ha run ZFS on a system with ECC memory, because you're extending that that uh, checksumming across the path right the way through to memory as it goes through the CPU into memory, or even bypassing the CPU directly from disk to the memory. So traditional mirroring this shows where it's failing. Application issues a read. So there's the application. It issues a read down to here. The mirror reads the first disk, which just happens to have a corrupt block, but it doesn't know that, and it just passes back the bad block. So if it had read the data off of this disk, it would have been a good block. But it happens to read it off this disk, which has got a bad block. And it just goes up to the file system, and... As you can see, the application gets the block of data back, but it's been corrupted. So this um, mirror, this management here has not validated that in any way whatsoever. With ZFS, not only is it able to detect the bad block, it's also able to heal the, ba the bad data as well. So again, the application issues a read and the ZFS mirror again tries the first disk, but because it's checksumming, it reveals that the block on the disk is corrupt. So it's gone to fetch that block, it's come back to the ZFS system, and it can see from the checksum it's bad. So what does the ZFS do? It goes to one of the other disks in the array, which happens in mirror, so it's the other disk, and it reads the same block, and the checksum is valid. So this is the key part in this third column here. The ZFS now passes the good data up back to the application, but not only that, it, it sends the good data to be rewritten, overwriting the bad data block in the other disk. So not only have we retained good data, but we've also repaired the bad data that's, which is on the other disk that supplied the bad data originally. So this is starting to get a little bit complicated, but basically it's saying that um, traditional RAID 
race four and five, got a fatal flaw with partial strike rights, which can lead to potential of a disc. Uh, sorry, a right hole if there's a, a power loss. Um, won't go t into that too much because it's a little bit detailed, but suffice to, t to say that again, because of the way the check something works in ZFS, it can get around this. So it's saying traditional RAID 4 and 5 can't detect or correct silent data corruption. Uh, these are just the XORing to get the, the, get the uh, parity disk, to get the parity information. Um, this is the RAID, how it works in uh, ZFS. There's three, actually three levels of RAID, Z1, 2 and 3. The RAID Z, one uses one parity disk, RAID Z2 is two parity disks, RAID Z3 is three parity disks. And what it's saying here is that it uses a dynamic stripe width, so they're not fixed. Variable block size, 512 bytes, 128 kilobytes. Um, each block is its own stripe, which is what this is showing here. Um, in fact, I'll go into that in a minute. Um, all writes are full stripe white writes. So again, it's transactional effectively. You write the full stripe. Um, none of this read, modify and write. It's just all done in one go. Um, because there's no RAID 5. Both single and double parity. As I say, there's now a, a, this is a little bit out of date. There is a, a Z3 option where you can have um, three parity disks. I think that's right. I'm starting to doubt myself now. Never used it, so that's probably one a little bit unsure. I'm pretty sure there is a Z3. Um, I'll quickly find that. Yeah, there is. Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, it can detect and correct silent data corruption because of this checksum de driven combinatorial risk reconstruction. And as I said, there's no special hardware. It just loves cheap disks. It, it can cater for this itself. And what this grid is showing here is um, the different stripes, if you like. So it always writes a parity block and then any number of data blocks up to the number of disks for, for that stripe. So you can see we've got um, stripe here, with parity, one parity disk and it's used the even disks. And then the next one has got the next second parity disk and the odd disks have been written for that, that, that set of data. The next right is a little bit smaller, but we've gone back to the parity zero disks and we just use the first three disks um, for that parity zero. The next right uses parity zero again with first three disks. And again, parity zero with the first disk. And you can see each time it's writing at least one parity disk and then any number of data disks after that. And it's balancing this out depending on the usage. Um, I believe these axes are just showing where there's, uh, I think it's bad data blocks, so they will get detected and corrected, or there could be even holes. But it shows the variable block size that's been written. Um, yeah, so resilvering is the term that is used in ZFS to recover or rebuild um, any data on, on the disk. So to create a new mirror or even a RAID stripe, what happens is copy from one disk to the other or you XOR them together as a RAID so that all copies are self-consistent. But this is even though that could be rubbish that's being rebuilt. And when you replace a failed drive, the whole disk is copied, even if the volume is nearly empty. So if you had a brand new RAID and 
you had to swap out one of the discs for some reason, then although there's no data on there, you'd have to wait for the whole RAID uh, system to be rebuilt for that one new disc that you've replaced. There's no checksums or validity checks along the way. And there's no assurance of progress until it's 100% complete. Your root directory may be the last block that's copied. You just don't know. And recovery from a transient outage, dirty region logging is slow and easily defeated by random writes. Again, you don't know what really what's happening or what's been corrupted and so on. With ZFS, it resilvers, i.e. rebuilds the storage pools block tree from the root down so it only rebuilds allocated data so again if we had this brand new uh, raid ZFS raid system that we need to swap a disk on it would take a matter of seconds maybe a minute at most to rebuild the system because it would only be the basic file structures because there's no data on the system that need to be built it does the most important blocks first, so it will start at the top of that data tree and work its way down. And as it copies every block, it knows about its children, therefore it increases the amount of discoverable data on the disk. So basically it starts at the Uber block, the Uber block points at children, those children point at more children, and that's how you can see it, it works its way down the tree. As it says here, it's only going to copy the live blocks. There's no time wasted copying free space. And as I've already said, there's effectively zero time to initialize a new mirror or RAID Z group. Um, dirty time logging for transient outages. It recalls the transaction group window that the device missed. So it knows um, if there was anything missing if there's a power cut and to resilver ZFS walks the tree and prunes where the birth time is less than the DTR I'm not sure what that is but obviously it's in, it, it goes through the tree and intelligently um, uh, rebuilds the data that's valid and not the invalid data so a five second outage takes five seconds to repair nice and simple and bearing in mind also, I'll just go back to that, what I said at the beginning, all this is done online. There's no outages. There's no, none of this can't access the data. Surviving multiple data failures. Um, this is just showing how um, damaged data can hide data um, below and how file system, this is traditional, this is traditional file system can become compromised so if this block of data here is silently corrupt it means that all the other blocks that were in that ch chain get hidden basically or it's hidden that the uh, data has got corrupted data replication above and beyond mirror or raid Z so not only can we mirror or put disks into a raid system each block could be replicated three times and ZFS will replicate that data on different devices wherever possible. Um, otherwise, if it can't, it will do it on the same device. So if you imagine if we've got Ray, uh, sorry, ZFS on one disk, obviously you can't put the data elsewhere, but it will replicate that data. If we've got it set to two or three replications, it will replicate the data across different areas of the disk to try and mitigate any potential problem with that single drive. All metadata, so it's not just user data, it's this data structures. There's always two or more copies of the metadata. And it's a very small cost in latency and bandwidth. Metadata is approximately 1% of the data. So it's a small overhead for basic belts, belts and braces. And um, you can set the number of replications for user data. You can set it to two or three replications or just the default one. And of course, can detect and correct silent data corruption in a multi-disc pool. ZFS survives any non-consecutive disk failures. And in a single disk, it can survive a loss of up to one eighth of the platter. So 
uh, just blowing the trumpet here again, ZFS survives failures that send other file systems to the tape. Disk scrubbing, this is the, uh, I loathe calling it file checking because it's not a file check. Um, traditionally a file check involves checking data structures and metadata for validity. Disk scrubbing is validating actual data blocks if you like and the checksums within the tree so it's not quite the same as a traditional um, file system check plus it can it's done online you'll have this scrubbing done in the background um, and I believe I'm right in saying that it does yield to any system tasks that are going on so it won't bog down the system because of intensive I.O. on the disks. And when you instigate a scrub, it its purpose is to find latent errors while they're still recoverable. So, it, it, again, ECC memory re recommended for scrubbing disks to ensure that when you're reading the data off the disk, that it's not actually the memory that's providing false positives. So the data is on the disk. You read it into some, some memory that's corrupt and it corrupts the data and flags it up, or worse still, because of the way scrubbing works, it actually writes the data back that it could be then corrupting the data that was on the disk that was good initially. So that's why it's important that uh, ECC memory is used to ensure that the data is read correctly and it's written correctly. And as you can see, it verifies the, the integrity of all the data. So it's not the data structures, it's the user data itself as well as I say normal file just system checks tend to be just about the metadata the, the file structure itself this is about all data on the disk it trans traverses the pool of metadata to re read every copy of every block so where we've asked the system to store two copies of all our data it will validate all those copies not just one copy it validates all mirror copies, all the RAID, Z, parity, and all the ditto blocks, which is what the multiple blocks are. It verifies each copy against its own 256-bit checksum, and it repairs data as it goes. So if it does find an error, it will correct it, and it will flag it up as well. And as you see down here, it's minimally invasive, low I.O. priority, and ensures that the scrubbing doesn't get in the way. Uh, user to find scrub rates coming soon. Um, I'm not sure that's even available now. It, because ZFS, the real ZFS is the Oracle closed source, I'm not sure what's available in the original. Certainly in the open ZFS, I'm not come across that. Um, I may be wrong. Because um, obviously this is getting updated regularly, but I'm not not aware of that at the moment. I may be wrong on that, but um, I don't think that's available yet. So scalability, scalability is another big plus point of ZFS. It's immense. Um, it's astronomical, literally. Um, Moore's Law says we need the 65th bit of the available 128 bits in 10 to 15 years. So given that this is this was probably written around the time that ZFS was being written, we've either reached that 10 to 15 years or surpassed it now. Um, so you can see in 10 to 15 years we've used one bit, if you like. Um, ZFS capacity, 256 quadrillion zettabytes, or zettabytes, and that's 1 billion terabytes. So it's an incredible amount of data. 256 quadrillion billion terabytes. That's an immense, immense number. Exceeds the quantum limit of Earth-based storage. So I think that's saying that, you know, every bit of data that could conceivably be stored on Earth, it, it wouldn't, it's exceeded that, you'll never, never fill it up. 100% dynamic metadata. So traditional file systems are normally allocated a certain number of files for directories, a certain number of inodes, 
etc etc there's no limits whatsoever you're limited by the space you've got and once you run out of space you just throw more discs at it and increase the space and there's no wacky knobs so there's no like little extra bits stuck on or little funny twiddly bits or anything like that it's just a uh, you know a simple file system simple from the user's point of view all the intelligence is within ZFS itself and we go back to this idea that everything's online there's concurrent everything everything's done um, in parallel parallel read writes without violating POSIX parallel constant time directory operations none of this the directory gets more and more and more files in it it takes longer and longer to process everything's done constant time performance copy and write design we've seen how that works it turns random writes into sequential writes because it's able to um, build up the writes into a more intelligent way of doing things and then for its intrinsically hot spot free so you won't get parts of the disk which are active more than others just because of the way it works because of the copy and write it it uses spare bits of disk to make the changes rather than make changes in place so for example if you had a file that's say a megabyte it's always been updated that one megabyte of the disk that, that file occupies is going to be continually hammered all the time all the changes are going to be continually made to that one megabyte of the disk and in theory that's the bit of the disk that's going to wear out sooner because it's getting more more usage in theory with copy and write because you're allocating a new block every time you want to make a change usage of the disk is spread out more evenly hence this term hotspot free pipelined io fully scoreboarded 24 stage pipeline with io dependency graph well it doesn't mean a lot to me but it sounds good um, maximum possible io parallelism so all the io is done in parallel wherever possible priority deadline scheduling out of order issue sorting and aggregation as we've seen dynamic striping across all devices it's got an intelligent prefetch um, I think we'll see that a little bit later on and as we've also seen variable block size so it's makes efficient use of the disk space um, dynamic striping yeah what this is saying is that if for example we've got a ZFS file system with um, eight disks in so this looked like these are four mirrored pairs of disks and we add another mirror in ZFS intelligently starts to allocate data on the other disks and the again the copy and write gently reallocate, reallocates old data and it, over time it will even out across the whole pool so you, again you're not getting a new disk added but most of the work is being done for example on the third disk set and nothing ever changes it's still being hammered on that third disk copy and write means it's generally um, spread over all the available storage devices yeah the intelligent prefetch so what it does it understands this matrix multiply problem it knows it's got an example here of three people watching a film so yeah these are the three main people we got Jeff Bonwick, Bill Moore and Matt Ahrens. They're watching the Matrix, they're watching at different times. ZFS is able to predict and prefetch the data ready for the um, viewers to watch. So they're all watching the same file but there's less chance of a hiccup because um, ZFS is prefetching, it knows the data. It's not just prefetching for Jeff or Bill. So it detects any linear access pattern and that's forward or backwards. Uh, variable block size, as you might imagine, no single block size is optimal for everything. Sometimes you might have huge files or sometimes you may have lots of small files. So the variable block size uh, caters for that. So large blocks, less metadata but higher bandwidth small blocks for more space efficient for small objects and record structure files easy 
databases of natural granularity file systems mash it to avoid read, modify and write. Um, why not arbitrary extents? All right, extents don't um, copy on write or check some nicely because they're too big. Obviously, they're you know, big chunks of data. But large blocks suffice to run disks at platter speed. Uh, that makes sense as well. You're dealing with reasonably sized blocks. Um, you'll be able to read lar larger amounts of data close to the platter speed off the disk. And per object granularity. So a 37k file basically consumes 37k, no wasted space. And yes, oh yes, that's the key thing about a variable block size. We've got compression, and because of variable blocks, this enables transparent block based compression. So if you've got 100 files that are all 100k each, but have got different data in, when they're compressed, they're all going to be different size. Um, so with variable block sizes, you can store those compressed blocks as their compressed size rather than a fixed size, which would again waste space. So yeah, now we're coming into the building compression. Uh, I'm not quite sure what SPA is. Um, but basically it's saying it's transparent to all layers. Each block is compressed independently and zero blocks converted into file holes. So you can see you've got four blocks. That one's actually 178k, that one's 37k and that one expands out at 69k. But they're all translated into 128k blocks. So this bit's a little bit out of date. There's two compression techniques, LZJB and GZIP, available today more on the way. The default one now is something called LZ4, and it's recommended. It's fast, and it compresses pretty well. I think there are some other compression um, algorithms available which compress better, but a bit slower. But generally, the default is good. Even for, I've read, uncompressible data, it's worth just leaving compression on. Um, especially with modern processors are fast enough it's virtually transparent um, so I think virtually all my file systems that I've used I've turned the compression on and just forgotten about it encryption well this was working in progress at the time I believe it's I think with the latest um, open ZFS it has got compression uh, encryption um, can't be sure on that I'm sure it's coming up if it's not available at the moment so going to administration because we've got pulled storage there are no, no concept of volumes to worry about so there's nothing to provision basically because as soon as you've got your hard disks added and put into the pool you've got all your space that you need there um, file systems become a ministerial control point, so that's where you manage stuff. As I say, these basically fall into the two programs that are uh, used for day-to-day -day administration. There's one to manage the pool, and there's one to manage the file systems, and that is the one that you, you do use day-to-day -day mostly because it's the one where you, you just manage the front end, basically. Um, so it's a hierarchical data structure, it inherits properties from parents. Um, per data set policies, policies, policies for snapshots, compression, backups, quotas, etc. Um, when you're finding out who uses the space, DF is instant. You can manage locally related file systems as a group and inheritance for large scale, scale administration as a snap as well. Um, and when I go into the demos, you'll, you'll see how that works. It is, it is really quite simple to manage. Um, the policies follows the data, so whether that's amount, shares, or properties, etc. And yeah, you can delegate administration to users to manage their own data. And the file systems are cheap. Use a ton. It's okay, really. This is very true. Initially, I'd create a pool, and then I'd create a file system, and that'll be it. But I found, well, you know, if you're, for example, going to download a whole host of um, packages or something in Linux, doing something, just create a new file system and put them on, 
because you can snapshot it that one file system without affecting anything else on this on your system you can delete things and go back to the snapshots you can do all sorts of things um, initially it's a bit alien so you don't tend to use the file systems a lot but once you start using ZFS you start creating file systems left, left right and center and I suppose the flip side to that is you end up with so many file systems you've got to manage them so <laughs> it's probably a sweet spot but yeah that doesn't cost you anything to create a new file system but you reap benefits by by using extra file systems um, so that's definitely uh, something to bear in mind use it as it says use a ton it's okay really and as I said a few times already everything's online you administer this all online you don't need to um, go offline the only time you go offline is to add hardware and you can never get around that unless you've got hot swappable drives which you know ZFS is capable of dealing with so if you've got that you need to swap out a disk and it's hot you've got hot swappable hardware you can do that online even so it almost literally is online everything so I won't go through these at the moment I'll go through these when I actually demonstrate the commands but you can see the commands here when dealing with the pools there's a command called zpool you've got a verb and then basically nouns and actions that um, uh, specify what you want to do and then as you can see that's just the one command to create the pool but you use ZFS loads of times to do loads of different things and you can see it's quite a common format You've got ZFS the verb and then the parameters for that verb how to do snapshots clone you can clone the file systems you can actually send so you can serialize the file system send them as a stream and receive that stream and rebuild the file system so that's that is quite a neat um, neat feature you can use that to create backups you can use it to make a clone of a file system a true clone like a deep clone if you like uh, to work on without having to create a snapshot um, it's powered by snapshots anyway so to, to send a file system again it's all online you create a file system you send that you sorry you create a snapshot of the file system you send the snapshot and you receive it as a snapshot um, really smart feature that is um, data migration as I've mentioned before it doesn't matter what system you're working on doesn't care about endingness um, so it read, reads this by byte swap um, uh, attribute only if the host endingness is not equal to the block endingness so if it differs that's when it looks to see if it needs to swap them um, as it said ZFS takes care of everything literally they've, they've put all the intelligence into ZFS makes things much easier to manage from an admin point of view so you can forget about device device paths config files fs tabs all that sort of thing it's managed all for you ZFS, zfs mounts and unmounts for you as necessary if you want to do it manually you can export and import pools it's up to you um so it's got native Samba support for Windows file systems. As I say, I've never used this. I've just been, I suppose I've been lazy and just carried on using what I've always known. Um, maybe it's something I should, um, should have a go at really. And you can see there's various options to control case insensitivity as you would get with a Windows system, virus scanning and so on. Uh, for probably for enterprises more you got this idea of zones so you can segregate parts of the pool um, don't think I've ever used that but it's it's an option ZFS route that's only starting to really become a possibility in the last sort of year or two um, I've still not used that because I use Gen 2 it's a bit of a not a hack but it's quite complex another thing that I'm wary about is if you do need to recover have you got a rescue disk that will give you the ZFS access to get to the root file system so 
that's something that stopped me from using ZFS as a root file system. Obviously with Solaris, um, it was built in right from the beginning, so that would be an option. Um, there wouldn't be any problems with using recovery disks and so on as it's, it's built in. Um, but I've, with my systems I use, I've tended to just use X4 to boot with and then just use ZFS for all the data that I'm sharing or data that I want to store and so on. But it is possible now in, in Linux. Um, so it says how they do testing, how they prove it. Um, and obviously this would have been how it was done in some microsystems. I imagine something similar was done with um, OpenZFS and ZFX, ZFS on Linux. Um, so probably more abuse in 20 seconds than you've seen in a lifetime. And it shows that how they've abused it basically. Over a million forced violent crashes without losing taste and integrity or leaking a single block. So that's quite impressive. So to summarise, um, it's they've tried to make it as simple to use as possible, which I have given the complexity of what you can do with it and how advanced it is. Um, it's definitely simple, very powerful. You can see all the uh, features it's got here: pool storage, snapshots, clones, compression, scrubbing, and RAID Z. Safe. The fact they can detect and correct silent data corruption, which no other file system is capable of doing. Um, it's fast and it really is fast. Um, you can get good throughput um, with a properly configured system. Um, and yeah, it was open. It's now closed, but as I say, there's other projects, open ZFX and particularly ZFX on, on Linux. And yeah, it was free. So these links, um, some of them are not working anymore obviously the Solar open solaris one's not working the zfs article on wikipedia is very good to read i'm not sure if these blogs or any of these are working or not um as i say zfs on fuse that stopped probably about ooh, probably well well over five years ago maybe six seven years ago it stopped when the zfs on linux started to become a thing um so um yeah, you can see which one of them were. Like I said, the, the ZFS wiki article is a good read if you want more in-depth knowledge and a bit more of the history. So that's it. Um, if you look on wiki, it says that it used, ZFS used to stand for Zettabyte File System, indicating the capacity it's able, capable of dealing with, and it's kind of never really stood for that, and it doesn't really stand for that now. I've always felt that the Z stood for what this tagline implies it's the last word in file systems i think they wanted it to be the last file system that would ever need to be developed in the world hence the z last letter of the english alphabet um, but that's my take on it but yeah so that's uh, hopefully a fairly quick overview of the zfs file system i can see how powerful it is uh, many powerful features. And so this series of videos will be ad hoc, but I will try and make it fairly regular when I post uh, further videos. Um, uh, my intention is to show how initially to set it up on a single disk and then to show some of the commands, but then more importantly, uh, show how to use it with multiple disk systems which is where its true power uh, comes to the fore um, and show how you know um, offlining a disk bringing a new disk online and recovery is dealt with how even just flipping one bit can be detected and so on um, do things like snapshots cloning um, and even sending file systems to other ZFS uh, file systems to demonstrate that um, and I even might try something I've never done before I'll try and create ZFS on a different file system a uh, different system that has got a different end in this see if that's possible um, and import that file system to show that part of it working 
So that's my intentions of what I, what I've got planned for the future. So thank you very much for watching. I hope uh, you enjoyed listening to it. I hope it's uh, opened your eyes to ZFS, especially if you've never seen it before, weren't aware of it. Um, if you like the video, I'd appreciate a, a like on the on the page, and if you've not already done so, I'd appreciate it if you subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. Thanks very much. Goodbye.